Right, this is chapter 17, part B on the cardiovascular system and the heart. So this section we're going to focus more so on the physiology of heart muscle contraction. So electrical events of the heart include depolarization. Um, so the heart's able to depolarize and contract without any nervous system stimulation. Um, although the autonomic nervous system is capable of altering the rhythm or the rate of the heart rate, um, it's pretty much going to be self-contained um, within the heart itself. Right? So an intrinsic um, conduction system. So remember from uh, anatomy one, depolarization is just where we are shifting or flipping the polarity of the uh, the cell membrane. So at rest, right, the cell membrane is going to be more negative inside. Um, so during depolarization, that positively charged sodium is going to influx inside the cell, which is going to reverse that charge, that voltage. So the inside becomes less negative. So coordinated heartbeat is a function of the gap junctions and what's called the intrinsic cardiac conduction system. Um, so we talked about the gap junctions before. So these are um, kind of the electrical connections between the cells um, that so ions and action potentials can pass from cell to cell fairly quickly. Um, so this allows the cell to um, function as that functional syncytium or a single coordinated unit. Um, so the intrinsic cardiac conduction system consists of what are called pacemaker cells. So these are non-contractile autorhythmic cells that are going to initiate and distribute those action potential impulses to coordinate uh, contraction of the heart. So setting the basic rhythm with the intrinsic cardiac conduction system. So there's a sequence of excitation um, as we go along the heart. Um, so these cardiac pacemaker cells are going to pass the impulses in the following order. Um, and this whole process takes roughly about a quarter of a second. So a fraction of a second, very quick. Right? Um, so it's going to begin at the sinoatrial node or the SA node. Um, so this is going to generate the initial impulses um, and set the pace of the heart. So these are the pacemaker um, cells of the heart. So then from there the impulses are going to travel to the atrioventricular node um, and then to the atrioventricular bundle. Right? So the AV bundle is going to connect the atria and the ventricles <coughs> um, and then from there it's going to split off into the left and right bundle branches. It's going to serve each side of the heart. Right? Um, so as we continue toward the apex of the heart, we get to the subendocardial conducting network, or um, sometimes referred to as the Purkinje fibers. Um, so these are going to come back up the sides of the heart, uh, back up toward the atria. So we'll look at all of these um, parts of the cardiac conduction system, starting with the SA node. So we said this was the pacemaker of the heart um, found in the right atrial wall. Um, so it's capable of depolarization faster than the rest of the myocardium. So that's why it determines the pace of the heartbeat. Um, so it generates impulses about 75 times per minute. So this is going to give us our sinus rhythm. So the inherent rate of the SA node is naturally 100 uh, impulses per minute, um, but the extrinsic factors of the parasympathetic nervous system are going to kind of keep it um, dampened down a little bit to 75. But in certain situations, say in a fight or flight situation, um, we are able to increase um, the number of impulses per minute by uh, stimulating the sympathetic nervous system. Um, so then from there, the impulse is going to spread across the atria and to the AV node. 
So at the AV node, um, it's going to actually delay the impulses by about a tenth of a second. Um, so this is because uh, we want to allow the atria plenty of time to complete its contraction before we initiate the ventricular contraction. So we want to make sure the atria is completely emptied and has completed its contraction before we go to the next set of contractions in the ventricles. So after the AV uh, node, we go to the AV bundle. Um, so this is the only real electrical connection between the atria and the ventricles, right? because the uh, cardiac muscle cells of the atria and ventricles are not going to be uh, actually connected via gap junction. So they rely on this bundle, uh, AV bundle, to distribute those impulses. So then the AV bundle is going to split off into our right and left bundle branches um, and carry those impulses all the way to the apex of the heart. So the last part of the cardiac conduction system are the Purkinje fibers. Um, so these are going to complete the pathway through the interventricular septum from the apex all the way up to the ventricular walls. So ventricular contractions going to immediately follow beginning at the atria and then going up toward, or sorry, beginning at the apex and going up toward the atria. Okay. Um, so when the heart contracts, it's going to squeeze from the apex first and then squeeze up toward the atria. So we want to push the blood up and out. So we're gonna squeeze it from the bottom. So some homeostatic imbalances with um, heartbeat could be um, defects in this intrinsic conduction system that can cause things like arrhythmias, which is just an irregular heart rhythm. Um, so in this, the atrial and ventricle contractions are uncoordinated, so they're not behaving as that single coordinated unit. Um, a fibrillation is rapid irregular contraction, so essentially the heart becomes useless for pumping the blood. Um, so circulation is essentially going to stop and can potentially result in brain death. So treatment for this would be a defibrillization. So it's going to kind of reset that SA node, that pacemaker of the heart, to hopefully restart regular normal depolarizations and contractions. So in order to reach the ventricles, that impulse has to pass through that AV node. So remember, the atria and the ventricles aren't electrically connected, so their only connection is that AV node. So if the AV node becomes defective, that can cause what's called a heart block. So essentially, few or no impulses um, are able to reach the ventricles, so they'll have to be kind of at their own intrinsic rate, which is too slow to maintain that adequate circulation and normal sinus rhythm. So this would be treated with an artificial pacemaker that uh, is able to recouple contraction of the ventricles to match that of the atria. So we have that coordination. We can measure the electrical activity of the heart using an electrocardiogram or an EKG, ECG. Um, so this is essentially a graph of all the action potentials at a given time not necessarily the tracing of one single action potential. Right? So from the beginning to the end of one complete heartbeat. Um, so to measure these, electrodes will be placed at various points on the body to measure the changes in voltage as the heart undergoes contraction. So the main features of the EKG um, we'll look at, so you have the P wave, so this first wave here is our P wave, so this represents depolarization of that SA node and the atria, so this will be where we begin our um, cardiac conduction, so that SA node sets the pace, it's our pacemaker. Um, the QRS complex is going to represent ventricular depolarization and atrial repolarization, so remember repolarization is where we are resetting um, back to the resting potential. Okay. So we're resetting for the next round of contraction. Okay. So the reason that the um, QRS complex is so much um, 
steeper of a wave than the P wave. Right, so P wave was only atrial depolarization. So think of the size difference between the atria and the ventricles. So the ventricles have much more um, surface area, many more cardiac muscle cells to depolarize. So that's going to be reflected as a bigger peak on the EKG graph. Okay. Um, so then our T wave is going to represent ventricular repolarization. So after the ventricle has depolarized and it's contracted, right? so then it has to relax and we have to repolarize to restore the uh, resting membrane potential. So the PR interval of the EKG is going to denote the time period from the beginning of atrial excitation to the beginning of ventricular excitation. The ST segment is going to represent the time period um, where the entire ventricular myocardium has been depolarized. So that's why we have this slight flat line here. So at this interval, at this segment, there's no net electrical activity occurring. Okay. Um, so then the QT interval is going to be the time period from the beginning of ventricular depolarization all the way to the end of ventricular repolarization. Right. So beginning to end of ventricular contraction and relaxation. Okay. So this is just another diagram kind of showing each of these steps along the way. So Step one, the heart wall is completely relaxed. So at this point, there's no electrical activity. Right? There's nothing going on. So this is going to represent our flat line. Okay? Um, so then as the SA node fires and generates that initial impulse, it's going to um, show us the P wave. Right? And the atria are going to start to depolarize. So in this figure, yellow is going to represent depolarization. So how, how it spreads from the SA node out to the atria. Mm -hmm. um, so the atrial walls at step three now are completely depolarized and there's no um, net electrical activity. So we have another small flat line segment. Mm -hmm. So now the atria are completely depolarized, completely covered in the yellow. Mm -hmm. So now once the impulse reaches that uh, AV node, remember it's going to be delayed, by just one tenth of a second. So we allow the atria enough time to complete their contraction so we get all the blood out of the atria and into the ventricles before we begin ventricular contraction. Okay. So now step four, QRS complex. So as the atria start to repolarize, so you'll see here they're starting to turn a little bit orange. Um, so now the ventricular walls are going to begin depolarization. So the yellow is going to start to spread um, through the ventricles. Right? Um, so ventricular depolarization and repolarization are going to both begin at the apex. So remember we're going to contract or squeeze the blood from the bottom up because we want it to go out. Okay? So step five, the atrial walls are now completely repolarized, so they're completely orange. Okay? Um, and the ventricular walls are completely depolarized, right? So they're filled with yellow. So at this point, there's no more net electrical activity. So we have another flat line section on the EKG. Right? Step six, the T wave is going to represent our ventricular repolarization. So again, it's going to begin from the apex and go up the sides of the ventricles. So once the ventricles are completely repolarized, the voltage is going to return to that baseline of the EKG, right? and we have another flat line where we would start the cycle all over again with the second heartbeat. Right? So we would start over again with the P wave and this whole process. So some mechanical events of the heart to talk about. Um, so systole would be the period of heart contraction. Right? Whereas diastole is the period of heart relaxation. So when we look at the cardiac cycle, we're looking at blood flow through the heart during one complete heartbeat. So from the beginning of atrial systole or contraction and relaxation, followed by the ventricular contraction and relaxation. Okay. So the cycle really just represents a series of different pressure and volume changes within the heart chambers. Um, so these mechanical events are going to follow the electrical events we just looked at on the EKG.
So we have three phases of the cardiac cycle. Um, so we'll start with total relaxation. So the beginning of the cardiac cycle is ventricular filling. So this happens in mid to late diastole when the heart is essentially in a relaxed state. So here the pressure is relatively low because 80% of the blood is going to just kind of passively flow from the atria um, through the AV valve into the ventricles. And so kind of just like let gravity do all the work. We just open the valves and the blood will flow down into the atria. Um, so atrial depolarization is going to trigger atrial systole or contraction. That gives us our P wave. Um, so this allows the atria to contract somewhat just enough to push that remaining 20% or so of blood into that ventricle. So the end diastolic volume would be the volume of blood in each ventricle at the end of um, this stage. Right? So how much blood can the ventricles hold um, before they contract? So now depolarization is going to spread to the ventricles and give us our um, QRS wave while the atria finish contracting and return to um, relaxation while the ventricles begin their contraction. So step one, ventricular filling, right, passive flow from the atria into the ventricles. So at this point, we see that atrioventricular valves are open. The SL valve, semilunar valves, are currently closed. So step two is ventricular systole or ventricular contraction. So at this point, the atria are going to relax while the ventricles begin to contract. So the rising pressure of the blood in the ventricles is going to now close these AV valves. Um, so two phases of ventricular systole. So your isovolumetric contraction phase. At this point, all the valves are closed. Right? So this little section of time right here, all valves are currently closed. Um, it's not until the ejection phase that they start to um, open those SL valves. So as the ventricles contract, that's going to increase the pressure and force those valves open. So now the SL valve, semilunar valves, aortic pulmonary valve are now open, right, the 2B. So our end systolic volume would be the volume of blood that's left over in each ventricle after contraction. Right. So no matter how well our heart's able to pump blood, there's always going to be a little bit of residual blood left behind. So this is our end systolic volume. So you see there's just a little bit left over in the ventricles. Um, that'll contribute to the next round of ventricular filling. So another aspect of the mechanical events of the heart are the heart sounds. So there's two sounds associated with the closing of the heart valves. So the first sound you hear um, would be the closing of the AV valves. So the AV valves here are open, and then once they close, then we get that first heart sound. The second heart sound is going to be a result of closing of the SL valves. So aortic and pulmonary valves are open, and once they close, we get the second heart sound. So the heart sounds are the lub-dub. Um, so again, the lub would be the AV valves, the tricuspid and bicuspid closing. The dub, the second sound, are the aortic and pulmonary semilunar valves closing. So heart murmurs are abnormal heart sounds heard when <clears throat> the blood hits some kind of obstruction in the heart. Um, so usually are indicative of a valve problem. So something like maybe an incompetent valve. So the valve fails to close completely, which would allow backflow of the blood. Um, <clears throat> so this would be like pumping the same blood over and over again. So it's not going to do our tissue cells any good if they don't receive that blood. Um, so sometimes this can be heard as kind of a swishing sound um, as the blood is going to swish around backwards from the ventricle back into the atria. A stenotic valve would be a stiff valve that is uh, going to fail to open completely. So because it doesn't open all the way, it's going to uh, restrict blood flow through that valve. So this is sometimes heard as like a clicking sound. So as the blood is kind of forcefully pushing its way through that narrow valve. Mm 
Cardiac output is the volume of blood pumped by each ventricle in one minute. Okay, so not blood pumped by the entire heart, but only by one ventricle in one minute. So cardiac output is um, a function of heart rate times stroke volume. So heart rate, as you know, is just the number of beats per minute, whereas stroke volume is the volume of blood pumped out by each ventricle with each beat. Okay. So if we do um, <clears throat> how much blood pumped out by one ventricle with each beat multiplied by beats per minute, that tells us how much volume of blood we've pumped out of the heart of that one ventricle over that one minute time period. Okay. So this is showing how stroke volume and heart rate are going to uh, determine our cardiac output. So we'll look at some other factors that can affect this stroke volume and heart rate, uh, which would in turn affect our cardiac output. Okay. Uh, so normal cardiac output is roughly five and a quarter liters per minute. So maximal cardiac output is generally four to five times the resting in non-athletic regular people. Um, but it can reach up to 35 uh, liters per minute in highly trained athletes. Um, so your cardiac reserve would be the difference between your resting and maximum cardiac outputs. So because cardiac output is a function of stroke volume and heart rate, if either or both of these are changed, that can result in changes in the cardiac output as well. So cardiac output is going to be affected by factors that lead to regulation of the stroke volume and regulation of the heart rate. So when we look at stroke volume mathematically, it is the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume. So again, the end diastolic volume is how much blood is collected in the ventricle before um, contraction. So during diastole, during relaxation, how much blood fills up these ventricles. Um, so the end systolic volume is how much blood remains in the ventricle after contraction. So end relaxation volume, end contraction volume. So again, there's always going to be a small amount of blood left over in the ventricles. We can't um, pump 100% of the blood out, but we try to get as much out as we can for maximum efficiency. But there's always a little bit of blood left behind, so this is your end systolic volume. So the stroke volume is how much blood actually left the heart. You see here we have the end diastolic volume that we begin with. So then after contraction, we only have a small amount of our end systolic volume. So in this example, um, end diastolic volume is 120 mils. Right? End systolic volume is 50 mils. So we subtract 50 from 120. That means that 70 milliliters of blood is what actually left the heart during contraction. So there's three factors that affect stroke volume that we'll look at, right? uh, which in turn affect cardiac output. Right? So stroke volume is going to be affected by um, what's called the preload, contractility, and the afterload. So preload is the degree of stretch of the heart muscle. So how much blood can we preload into the atria? So that's going to depend on how much those cardiac muscle cells are able to stretch, so how much blood they can hold. So any changes in the preload can cause changes in the stroke volume because it's going to affect our end diastolic volume. So the relationship between preload and stroke volume is sometimes referred to as the Frank Starling law of the heart, which just means that an increased preload Right, so if we load more blood into the atria, that's going to increase the amount of blood that fills the ventricles during diastole. So it's going to increase our end diastolic volume. Right? So remember, end diastolic volume is going to um, determine our stroke volume. Okay? So we increase our end diastolic volume, that's going to increase our stroke volume, which increases our cardiac output. So it's an, all a positive association.
So vice versa, if preload were to decrease, then EDV would also decrease as well as stroke volume and cardiac output. Contractility is the contractile strength of the muscle cells. Okay. Um, so an increased contractility is going to lower our in systolic volume. So that means we're going to have a greater force of contraction. So we're going to pump more blood out of the ventricles. So that means we'll have less blood remaining in our in systolic volume. Um, so this increased contractility can be caused by that sympathetic nervous system, so that fight or flight response that releases epinephrine um, or adrenaline that's going to stimulate increased calcium influx. Right? So remember, what does calcium have to do with muscle contraction? So it's going to um, bind to that troponin to move it out of the way so we can form those cross bridges with that actin and myosin. So the more calcium we have, the more cross bridge formations we can have, which means the stronger those muscle cells can contract. So contractility increase the force of contraction. So that's going to decrease our in systolic volume. So we pump more blood out of the heart, which increases our, or our stroke volume, which is going to increase our cardiac output. And again, vice versa, if we were to decrease contractility or decrease the force of contraction, that means we're going to have more blood left over in the ventricles after contraction. So that would increase our in systolic volume. So if we have more blood left over in the ventricles, that means that our stroke volume has decreased because we didn't pump all of that blood out because it's remaining in the ventricles, which would ultimately decrease our cardiac output. So there's less blood leaving the heart um, per minute. Right, so the third factor that can affect stroke volume is the afterload. So this is the pressure exerted by arterial blood that the ventricles have to overcome to eject the blood from the heart. So there's always some pressure of the blood in uh, these arteries that's going to kind of be forcing its way back against the, um, the valve. So aortic pressure is generally around 80 uh, millimeters of mercury, whereas the pulmonary trunk pressure is only around 10. So remember, the pulmonary circuit is a very short circuit, it's low pressure because it just has to travel from the heart to the lungs and back. So it's going pretty much right next door. It doesn't have to travel very far, so we don't need a lot of pressure behind it. With the uh, systemic circuit, the aorta right, has a long distance to travel, so we need a high pressure um, to ensure that the blood's able to reach all areas of the body. So if something like hypertension, high blood pressure can increase the afterload. Um, so that's just going to increase the pressure that the ventricles have to overcome right, to get the blood out of the heart and into those arteries. So um, this would have a negative um, correlation with cardiac output. So an increase in the afterload is going to increase our in systolic volume, right? Because we're not able to pump as much blood out of the heart because we have so much pressure working against us, right? So if we have more blood left over in the ventricle after contraction, that means less blood exited the heart, which decreases our stroke volume and decreases our cardiac output. Okay, so just review again really quickly. So preload is positively associated with cardiac output. So an increase in the preload is an increase in cardiac output right, and stroke volume. Um, increase in contractility is also positively associated. So it would have an increase in stroke volume and output. Afterload is going to be inversely related. So an increase in afterload results in a decrease in cardiac output and vice versa. So if we had a decrease in the afterload, that means that we're able to pump more blood out of the heart. So our in systolic volume would decrease, meaning stroke volume increases and cardiac output increases. So if stroke volume decreases as a result of decreased blood volume or weakened heart, we can still try to maintain our cardiac output by increasing the heart rate and contractility. So heart rate can be regulated by the autonomic nervous system, uh, again, chemicals, and a few other factors.
So the autonomic nervous system would be that um, sympathetic fight or flight system. So the epinephrine and adrenaline that's going to increase the heart rate, again, by um, releasing more calcium to allow more of those cross bridge formations. So some chemical regulation of heart rate include things like hormones, like we just mentioned, epinephrine from the adrenal medulla, the sympathetic nervous system, um, can increase heart rate and contractility. Also thyroxine, the thyroid hormone, can increase heart rate um, and enhance the effects of this epinephrine. Okay. Um, some ions can help regulate heart rate, so things like calcium and potassium, sodium. Um, so all have to be maintained within those normal ranges, homeostatic ranges, um, because any type of imbalance when we deal with heart muscle can be very dangerous. Okay. So it's showing a few factors to affect cardiac output. Um, so again, so sympathetic activity, right, ventricular filling time um, are all going to lead to an increase in our end diastolic volume, so our preload or our ventricular filling. Um, so epinephrine, thyroxine, right, these are going to increase our contractility or our strength and force of contraction. So we pump more blood out of the heart, which is going to decrease our end systolic volume, right, which in turn would increase the stroke volume. In the nervous system, um, so that sympathetic activity that's going to release that epinephrine, right? Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, if we want to decrease heart rate or cardiac output, we would send parasympathetic impulses. So remember, the parasympathetic is your rest and digest system. So it's going to decrease um, heart rate and contractility. Um, just a few other factors that may influence heart rate, things like age. Um, so a fetus has the fastest heart rate, um, and as they develop and get older, it will decline um, <clears throat> somewhat. Um, gender, females typically have faster heart rates than males. Exercise, of course, can increase your heart rate. Um, body temperature, so increased body temperature can also affect heart rate. So when looking at heart rate, uh, there's a couple issues we may run into. So one being tachycardia, which would be an abnormally fast heart rate. Um, so here we have a normal, kind of stable heartbeat. Um, Whereas the fast beat um, is kind of disorganized, it's not as smooth, there's not as much space in between beats. Um, bradycardia would be a slow heart rate, so we have a long period of time between subsequent heartbeats. Um, another type of homeostatic imbalance would be congestive heart failure. Um, so this is a progressive condition where the cardiac output eventually gets so low that blood circulation um, cannot adequately meet the tissue's needs. Um, so typically this is due to a weakened myocardium um, that's caused by coronary atherosclerosis. So clogged arteries um, can cause fat buildup um, and can impair the oxygen delivery and the blood flow um, through the heart and the cells. So eventually the heart can become hypoxic and contract inefficiently or even lead to a heart attack. <clears throat> so persistent high blood pressure can also contribute to congestive heart failure. Um, so generally anything aortic pressures over 90 millimeters mercury can cause the myocardium to have to exert more force during contraction. So we have chronic increase in our end systolic volume. Um, so over time, the heart's kind of overworking and pumping harder than it should. Um, so that can lead to uh, myocardium uh, hypertrophy and weakness. So just like when you lift weights and your muscles get larger to deal, uh, to adapt to the increased stress and demand you're putting on it, the heart muscle is the same way. So if we put increased demand and stress on our heart, it's constantly having to overwork itself to pump the blood. That muscle is going to get thicker um, and eventually become weaker. Uh, multiple myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. So <clears throat> again, when heart cells die, they're replaced with scar tissue. And since scar tissue cannot contract like muscle cells, the heart's not going to beat as efficiently as it did before. 
<clears throat> so eventually this could also lead to dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, so where the ventricles become stretched and distended and kind of flabby. Um, so the myocardium starts to deteriorate and the ventricles aren't capable of fully contracting with enough force to expel the blood from the chamber. So either side of the heart can be affected in congestive heart failure. If it's the left side of the heart that gives out first, it would result in a pulmonary congestion. So essentially the blood is going to back up into the lungs because it has nowhere else to go. So it can't enter the heart because um, the heart's already full with blood because the heart can't efficiently pump the blood. So the blood's going to get backed up into the lungs. Um, a right side failure is um, going to lead to peripheral congestion. So the blood is going to pool in the extremities and the body organs um, and cause edema and swelling. So eventually, though, failure of either side is ultimately going to weaken the other side right? because it's a side by side, two dual pumps that work together. So um, this can lead to a decompensated or seriously weakened heart. Um, so say if we have right side failure, the left side is going to try to compensate for that failure, but it won't be able to keep up. Um, so treatment for um, right side congestion include removal of fluid, some drugs to reduce the afterload or the pressure, um, and to also increase the contractility of the heart muscle cells. <clears throat>